8968 заседание Совета Безопасности объявляется открытым. Предварительная повестка дня данного заседания гласит письмо постоянного представителя Российской Федерации при Организации Объединенных Наций от 13 апреля 2014 года на имя председателя Совета Безопасности С-2014-254. Повестка дня утверждается. На основании правила 37 временных правил процедуры Совета я приглашаю принять участие в данном заседании представителей Германии и Украины. Решение принимается. На основании правила 39 временных правил процедуры Совета я приглашаю принять участие в данном заседании следующих докладчиков. Госпожу Розмари Декарло, заместитель генерального секретаря по политическим вопросам и вопросам миростроительства. Его превосходительство господина Мика Кинунина, специального представителя действующего председателя ОБСЕ на Украине и в трехсторонней контактной группе. Его превосходительство... His Excellency Mr. Yashar Halit Chevik, Chief Monitor of the OSC Special Monitoring Mission in Ukraine, and Ms. Tatiana Montian, Ukrainian civil society activist. It is so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I now give the floor to Ms. Rosemary DiCarlo. Thank you, Mr. President. I last briefed this council on the situation in Ukraine as it relates to the implementation of the Minsk agreements on 11 February 2021. At that time, I drew attention to the fragile security situation that prevailed despite the nominal ceasefire in place. Today, a year since that briefing, tensions in and around Ukraine are running higher than at any point since 2014. Speculation and accusations around a potential military conflict are rife. Whatever one believes about the prospect of such a confrontation, the reality is that the current situation is extremely dangerous. The issues underpinning the current crisis are complex and longstanding. They tie together the eight-year conflict in Eastern Ukraine with the larger issues related to European security architecture. Although seemingly intractable, given the stakes involved for our collective security and European stability, these issues can and must be solved through diplomacy in the full use of the many available regional and other mechanisms and frameworks. We support all such efforts, including through the Secretary General's good offices. Mr. President, regrettably, there's been little, if any, meaningful progress in the implementation of the various provisions of the Minsk agreements. Despite repeated efforts, the talks both in the number D4 format and the discussions led by the trilateral contact group remain deadlocked. We welcome the efforts of France and Germany to host the recent N4 discussions to break the current impasse and hope that these will continue. The Minsk agreements remain the only framework endorsed by this council in resolution 2020, uh, 2202 for a negotiated peaceful settlement of the conflict in Eastern Ukraine. In this regard, we note with concern the reports of fresh ceasefire violations across the contact line over the past several hours. If verified, these violations must not be allowed to escalate further. We call on all sides to exercise maximum restraint at this time. We also call on all concerned to refrain from any unilateral measures that may go against the letter and spirit of the Minsk agreements or undermine their implementation and result in further tensions, including related to the status of certain areas of Luhansk and Donetsk. We commend the important work of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. The Council will hear shortly from Ambassador Miko 
Kinunan, Special Representative of the OSCE's Chairperson in Office in Ukraine, and Ambassador Hala Chevik, Chief Monitor of the OSCE's Special Monitoring Mission. It's essential that we support their work, particularly at this critical time. The Special Monitoring Mission, which carries out its crucial functions despite considerable challenges, must enjoy safe and secure conditions. Mr. President, on 14 February, the Secretary General expressed his deep worry regarding a potential military conflict in Europe. He reminded the international community that the price in human suffering, destruction and damage to European and global security is too high to contemplate. The Secretary General has remained fully engaged with key actors, including the governments of the Russian Federation and Ukraine, and has reiterated the same unambiguous message. There is no alternative to diplomacy. It's incumbent on all member states to fully respect the key principles of the United Nations Charter, to settle disputes by peaceful means, and to refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. In this regard, let me restate the commitment of the United Nations to the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders as called for in GA resolutions. The recent diplomatic contacts, including between heads of state, are welcome, but more needs to be done urgently including tangible steps on the ground and an end to inflammatory rhetoric to diffuse tensions. Mr. President, as we have done throughout the eight years of the conflict, the United Nations continues to stand with the people of Ukraine. The UN country team in Ukraine remains fully operational. Our humanitarian colleagues are committed to providing assistance in accordance with the humanitarian principles of neutrality, impartiality, humanity and independence. This includes, for example, three humanitarian convoys that delivered over 140 metric tons of life-saving assistance across the contact line since the start of 2022, benefiting thousands of people in need. It's imperative that safe and unimpeded access by humanitarian actors is respected by all sides under any circumstances. Amid the current tens tensions, we should not lose sight of the existing dire humanitarian needs impacting 2.9 million people, with the majority living in non-government controlled areas of eastern Ukraine. Donor support has allowed us to provide aid to over 1.5 million people during the first nine months of 2021, the highest level since 2017. This critical achievement must be sustained amid the increasing severity of humanitarian needs. Early and adequate funding of the 190 million 2022 humanitarian response plan is needed to continue to meet the urgent needs of 1.8 million vulnerable people, including over 1 million in government controlled areas and 750,000 in non-government controlled areas. Mr. President, for the war-weary people of Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, the impact of COVID-19 on top of the conflict has caused even more grave disruption and suffering. Millions of people who prior to the pandemic could still maintain family and community connectivity have been unable to travel freely across the contact line due to COVID-19 related restrictions. As a consequence of their increased isolation and abrupt loss of access to basic services and livelihoods, the needs of these already vulnerable of this already vulnerable population have been exacerbated. At the same time, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights continues to document civilian casualties and the impact of hostilities, monitor freedom of movement, and receive and report on allegations of human rights violations. Despite the persistent tensions, last year saw the lowest number of civilian casualties documented by OHCHR since the beginning of the conflict. Overall adherence to the ceasefire has been an important factor in this trend. It must continue. Mr. President, over 14,000 people have already lost their lives in the conflict in Eastern Ukraine. 
As the Secretary General said this week, we simply cannot accept even the possibility of a new conflict in Ukraine. Indeed, we are facing a test. The world is looking to the collective security mechanisms in Europe, but also to this council to help ease tensions and ensure that only that the only skirmishes will be diplomatic. We cannot afford to fail. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. I think. Ms. Rosemaria de Carla for her briefing. I now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Mikko Kinunen. TCG supports implementation of the settlement provided by the Minsk agreements. However, in times like these, it is impossible to address the Donbas issue without paying attention to the bigger contexts, which is the tense security situation around Ukraine and in the region, as well as uh, the intensive high level of diplomacy. Arguably, this bigger context has a strong interlinkage with the work of the trilateral contact group. This argument is based on views according to which finding a solution to the main task of the TCG, implementation of the Minsk agreements, could help in solving many of the issues of the bigger picture. However, presently, positions of the participants to the discussions of the TCG are too far from each other. Consequently, as of now, it is not yet possible to solve the conflict related uh, to uh, Eastern Ukraine within the TCG. We need to continue our work. At the same time, it is important to uh, notice note that all the elements of the three Minsk agreements are relevant and need to be addressed. These agreements, uh, Minsk Protocol, Minsk Memorandum, and the Minsk package of measures continue to form the basis of our work. It is crucial that all sides will continue to remain committed. It is popular to accuse uh, one or another participant to the discussions for violating Minsk agreements or for not wanting to implement Minsk agreements. Here, my message would suggest caution. The fact is that none of the elements of the Minsk agreements has been implemented or at least fully implemented. Furthermore, in my experience, it is not possible nor appropriate to single out only one party for being responsible for this. Everyone involved in the discussions of the trilateral contact group needs to bear their responsibility for carrying out what has been agreed. We need more flexible positions and readiness to compromise. Mr. President, Security situation along the 480 kilometers long contact line that separates government controlled area from the non government controlled area of eastern Ukraine is one of the key focuses of the work of the TCG. In the present situation, particularly with reference, with reference to the bigger contexts, it is important to continue to stay calm also along the contact line. Provocations are to be avoided. At the end of the day, no one would benefit from new military activities. Concrete uh, press example um, of a 
potentially provocative situation uh, is the alleged, alleged uh, shelling uh, that occurred this morning in Luhansk region, close to the contact line. It is important to try to establish facts, facts in a swift manner and to avoid escalation. One participant uh, to the discussions of the TCG has requested for an um, extraordinary TCG meeting. Armed conflict uh, related to Eastern Ukraine is eight years old, as referred by the Undersecretary General. The conflict continues, has resulted in over 14,000 victims, hundreds of thousands of IDBs and refugees. Crossings uh, over the contact line have dropped uh, civilian crossings by 95% since the closing of checkpoints uh, two years ago, resulting in additional civilian suffering and hardship. Conflict direct affected areas with ongoing military activities have sadly become part of everyday life for countless Ukrainian citizens. In late December uh, 2021, uh, two months ago, Participants uh, uh, to the discussions of the trilateral contract group agreed fully to adhere to the ceasefire agreement of July uh, 2020. This New Year's commitment two months ago did not hold well enough. However, the positive side of the matter was for one month's period following the commitment, there were 70% less ceasefire violations than during the month before. This once again indicates if there is political will, it is possible not to use arms, possible not to fire. Two, there have been small positive steps uh, with our work, such as creation of an environmental expert group. Recent IAEA visit to the non-government controlled area shows that when there is will uh, on all sides, agreeing is possible. But clearly not enough progress has been made. One reason to this are status related issues that uh, may from the outside appear procedural, but are actually part of the core substance. Mr. President, Excellencies, during this week, uh, the State Duma of the Russian Federation approved a resolution calling uh, upon the Russian president to recognize independence of certain areas of Donetsk and Luhansk regions. This has caused questions and internal discussion within the TCG. While I know that the Duma resolution does not reflect uh, the official line of the government, it is important to emphasize that all participants need to remain committed to the goal of restoring Ukraine's uh, sovereignty over the uh, totality of its uh, territory. At the same time, the big context, the bigger picture, the unprecedented international focus on Ukraine and, and the region should be used as an opportunity to intensify uh, to unblock the work of the TCG. I am grateful for the recent high-level contacts between uh, the leaders of the Normandy Four, as well as the two meetings of the Normandy Four political advisors, and for example, uh, of the OSC chairman in office uh, discussions in Kiev and Moscow during the past days. These all could give new impetus to unblock DCG's work. They could, for example, to give us an op uh, opportunity to have and focus, uh, uh, to have substantial discussions on certain concrete draft laws at the very heart of the Minsk uh, agreements. Finally, TCG has now met uh, in video format in online meetings almost for two years. Meetings in video format lack drive and confidentiality. For several reasons, they do not offer possibilities for genuine negotiations and in interaction. My goal remains uh, 
to return to face-to-face -face meetings of our unique platform that does bring together Ukraine, Russia, the OSCE, as well as uh, representatives of certain areas of Donetsk and uh, Luhansk uh, regions. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, His Excellency, Mr. Kinunen, for his briefing. I now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Yashar Halit Chevik. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Excellencies, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to brief this council today. In my capacity as the chief monitor of the OEC special monitoring mission to Ukraine, and as the coordinator of the working group on security issues in the trilateral group, I will update you on key developments on the situation in eastern Ukraine during the past year. These include the security situation along the contact line, the impact of nearly eight years of the conflict on civilians, and the SMM's increasingly challenging operational environment. The security situation remains fraught with tension. The gradual frame of the ceasefire I described to the Council last February has regrettably accelerated and inevitably civilians on both sides of the contact line continue to bear the burden of the tensions and resulting insecurity. I further have to note with deep concern that the impediments to the SMM's mandated freedom of movement have not only persisted, but escalated in the past year. In times of heightened tensions in and around Ukraine, when the mission's impartial and objective reporting is vital, these restrictions are especially unacceptable since they limit the mission's capabilities. The SMM has been vilified in public rhetoric and mission members have at times been intimidated. Our technical monitoring tools are subjected to intense interference daily. The mission suffered temporary blockades of operations in Donetsk region last October. In Luhansk region, the SMM is also subjected to a blockade. SMM's sustainability is under risk as it has been deprived of its operational freedom and independence. In this context, I also wish to highlight my concern with the fact that the contact line remains exceedingly difficult to cross, both for SMM and civilians. It increasingly looks like and feels like a border, which it transects and divides families and communities and provision of services. Before elaborating on these developments, I wish to stress that in such challenging circumstances, the political will of the sides to strictly adhere to the ceasefire and reduce tensions is imperative. Silence along the contact line is of utmost importance for allowing space for negotiations. Abstaining from inflammatory public rhetoric is also essential. Mr. President, since I last briefed the esteemed council, the overall security situation along the contact line in eastern Ukraine has remained volatile. After the unprecedented period of relative calm that followed the 22nd July 2020 trilateral contact group agreement on measures to strengthen the ceasefire throughout 2021, we saw a gradual but sustained increase in the level of armed violence. In 2021, between August and December in particular, the mission recorded high numbers of ceasefire violations, including increased use of heavy weapons that the sides had committed to withdraw, as well as their consequences in civilian casualties and damage to infrastructure. In November, the SMM recorded levels of kinetic activity, including uh, the more destructive weapons, worrying the close to those recorded prior to July 22nd measures agreement. At the 22nd December 2021 TCG meeting, the participants expressed strong determination to uphold the ceasefire regime. 
The first month following that meeting saw a considerable decrease in the level of violence by some 60%. But, but tensions nevertheless remain high, fueled also by the wider discussions surrounding the security situation in and around Ukraine. Of serious concern is the fact that in 2021, the SMM recorded ceasefire violations in and near the three symbolically important pilot disengagement areas, including with the use of proscribed weapons. In Luhansk region, in particular, the wider Karomaisk, Kopasna Zolate area consistently remained uh, a hotspot. On 3 December, the SMM recorded a violent exchange of fire inside and near the Stanislavski disengagement and crossing point. This was an especially dangerous situation as civilians in transit, including children, were put at risk. This was the first time since two, April 2020 that SMM recorded ceasefire violations inside this area. Importantly, there, the benefits of this engagement had been clearly demonstrated as it allowed for the reconstruction of the Statiska Luhansk Bridge, one of the symbols of this conflict. I underline the significance of violence in these three areas as it provides insight into the site's will or at times its absence to adhere to their commitments. In this context, I also wish to share my deep concern over the site's holding of live fire exercises inside the security zone throughout 2021 and since the start of 2022. These ceasefire violations deserve our particular attention as they violate both the comprehensive ceasefire regime and the specific TCG decision of 3 3rd March uh, 2016 prohibiting the conduct of such exercise. Last month, they were approximately 10% of all ceasefire violations recorded by the SMM. Since the beginning of 2022, the mission is already recording on average twice as many ceasefire violations per day as it did over the same period in 2021, when the site's adherence to the ceasefire had already started framing. As I noted, the increasing levels of violence with the use of heavy weapons inevitably led to a rise in the number of corroborated civilian casualties due to shelling and small arms fire. In 2021, the SMM corroborated more civilian casualties due to shelling and small arms fire, 48, than those caused by mines and other explosive objects. Nearly 60% of the corroborated civilian casualties as a result of shelling and small arms fire, as well as nearly 70% of all cases of damage to civilian objects and the infrastructure sites were recorded between October and November last year. Other violations of commitments undertaken by the sites have also continued. The SMM recorded new trench extensions and improvements to positions, the presence of heavy weapons and military and military type positions in residential areas, and the increased use of non-SMM unmanned aerial vehicles. As a last point on this issue, it is worth mentioning that violations occur on either side of the contact line. Mr. President, regrettably, discussions in the working group on security issues have been at an impasse for the past year. In principle agreements reached in 2020 on 19 demining areas, an updated mine action plan, four new disengagement areas, and a draft addendum to clarify some aspects of the framework decision on disengagement have not been actioned. The security-related conclusions of the 2019 Normandy 4 Paris Summit require new political impetus to be translated into tangible project progress. Since April 2021, participants have been discussing a draft addendum to the 22nd July measures agreement, but common ground has yet to be found. As I underlined last year, such mechanism would facilitate the escalation, address the persistent issue of impunity, and contribute to building confidence on the ground. 
it will demonstrate the side's political will to act in line with their commitments. Mr. President, I wish to underline that the communities along the contact line are deeply traumatized by living in constant danger and uncertainty. I already mentioned the 48 casualties caused by small arms fire or shelling. In 2021, the SMM corroborated another 43 cases of people injured or killed by mines, unexploded ordnance, and other explosive devices. It is imperative that the sides do their utmost to mitigate these constant threats, even unilaterally in parallel with the negotiations on overall solutions. Mr. President, the challenges of the ongoing pandemic have also endured and continue to make daily life even more challenging for civilians on both sides of the contact line. The past year saw no improvement in civilians' freedom of movement between the government and non-government controlled areas of Ukraine. Crossing the contact line remains limited to two of the five crossing, existing crossing points. Only the pedestrian crossing at Staniska Luans Bridge is accessible on a daily basis. There have, has been no progress in opening of the two new crossings at Zolote and Shastia, even though in principle agreement on their opening was reached in July 2020. Even as some of the pandemic-related restrictions were eased last year, official data shows that crossings in 2021 remain a mere 5% of the pre-pandemic levels. These are not just statistics, they represent the elderly who can no longer access their pensions, as well as the young who are losing out on educational and economic opportunities. Access to other services, including healthcare and documentation, such as passports, birth and death, death certificates, is being severely curtailed, while people, family, friends, communities, are being separated from each other. Estrangement between communities spanning the contact line should not become entrenched. The needs and the rights of civilians should take precedence. Both existing and new crossing points should be fully open and all restrictions on both sides of the contact line lifted without delay. In these challenging circumstances, it is also vital that crucial critical infrastructure that civilians depend on for their basic needs remain operational and protected from the impact of armed violence. Last year, the SNM continued facilitating and monitoring repairs to gas, water, and electricity infrastructure objects, benefiting millions of civilians on both sides of the contact line. Regrettably, since February 2021, and especially in the wake of an incident inside the disengagement area near Zolote in October, the process of exchanging security guarantees among the sides has been at an impasse, particularly in Luhansk region. I would like to underline that the exchange of security guarantees, which are essential for conducting vital repairs, had previously not been linked to increased tensions on the ground. This process should not be politicized as it is done now. Mr. President, reviewing these challenges, it appears to me that there has never been a greater need for impartial and objective monitoring delivered by SNM. The sides also recognize the importance of the mission's work. Their reactions to the temporary relocation of some mission members last weekend clearly indicated that. Throughout the past year, the SMM has continued managing the challenges I described and performing its mandated tasks. However, since I last briefed this council, the mission's work has continued to be undermined by persistent and escalating constraints on its freedom of movement, predominantly in areas outside government control. I need to underline that freedom of movement is what makes monitoring, monitoring as foreseen in the mandate, uh, it is essential for enabling the SNM to serve as an impartial eye and ear of the international community in Ukraine. I wish to recall that this freedom of movement is a shrine in the mission's mandate as well as in Minsk agreements. In 2021, some 91% of all freedom of movement restrictions 
experienced by SMM took place in non-government controlled areas. The past year saw emissions movements across the contact line increasingly denied, delayed and conditioned. These impediments continue to undermine uh, the SMM's operational unity and threaten the sustainability of its work in non-government controlled areas. Impediments to SMM's use of technical monitoring tools have also continued on both sides of the contact line. Instances of gunfire assessed as targeting SMM's unmanned aerial vehicles almost doubled. The intensity of GPS signal interference in 2021 reached unusually high levels. The degradation of our aerial environment in 2021 particularly affected the SMM's long-range railways. This platform is the only one that can monitor the full length of the contact line and the areas near the uh, near the border outside government control 24-7 basis. However, eight, over 80% of the flights encountered interference. Mr. President, the past year has been difficult on many levels. At a time of heightened tensions on the ground and in public rhetoric, it is imperative for the signatories of the Minsk agreements to adhere to all their commitments, first and foremost among them, to strictly adhere to ceasefire regime. Political impasse and increased violence reinforce one another. I hope that the recent resumption of the Normandy 4 consultations and other confident building efforts under the auspices of the OEC will provide much needed political impetus to relieve tensions in the region and for conflict resolution process to move forward. The restoration of SMM's freedom of movement is meanwhile paramount in order that the mission can do its job. The SMM should be actively supported by the sites in installing new cameras and opening long plan forward patrol bases. The SMM should again be able to cross the contact line without arbitrary condition and denials. It's unimpeded and unconditional access through the contact line, especially in Luhansk region, must be restored without de delay. Attempts to vilify the mission by public accusing of it, of, of, by accusing it of bias should also come to an end. The impasse in exchange of security guarantees among the sides also requires urgent resolution all along the contact line. The capacity on the ground exists, the will to use it needs to be strengthened and be guided solely by the needs of the long-suffering civilians. The SMM remains available to facilitate constructive efforts in this regard. Mr. President, before concluding my remarks, I would like to highlight two points. I remain convinced that the SMM's role remains critical to reducing tensions and fostering peace, stability and security. Yet, our key challenge has been to ensure the space for the implementation of that mandate. Lacking any way to enforce this implementation, we need the strong and sustained support of the international community to urge the sides to implement their commitments and restore SMM's freedom of movement. Where there is a political will, there is a way. And I remember particularly the, the construction of the Stanislav Luhansk Bridge after so many years and the encouraging periods of quiet that briefly followed the July 22nd measures agreement. Progress is possible. I'm also compelled to highlight the continuing plight of civilians. I have described the death and injury caused by continued exchanges of fire and by mines. However, allow me to also note that with the contact line nearly completely sealed for two years already, people to people contacts have been greatly disrupted and communities, even families, have been divided due to no fault of their own. This is taking place against the background of other developments that are further deepening the divide between people living on both sides of the contact line. The political challenges of this eight-year conflict should not eclipse the human cost. I implore the signatories of the uh, Minsk agreements to be mindful of these costs 
and redouble their efforts. I also urge the members of this venerable council to work with the sides and support their efforts to that end. If you allow me, Mr. President, I would also like to give uh, some information about the developments of today's uh, morning hours. Between yesterday evening and 11.20 Kiev today, uh, uh, Kiev time today, the SMM has recorded 500 explosions along the contact line. The wider areas of disengagement areas near Staniska Luhansk, Zolote uh, were particularly kidnapping. After 11.20, uh, we have recorded uh, about 30 explosions, so the, the tension may seem to be easy. Uh, during the early hours, uh, around noon, uh, the SMM has asked the sides to strictly adhere to the ceasefire commitments. It is critically important to de-escalate immediately to avoid further aggravation of the situation. Uh, SMM is aware and is following up on the reports of civilian casualties, damage to civilian infrastructure, uh, and uh, uh, all along the uh, contact line during the last 24 hours. We will continue to follow up uh, the security situation as much as our uh, resources allow, of course. The, the increased kinetic activity happened along roughly 200 kilometers of the contact line, basically uh, on the Luhansk Oblast, uh, and many SMM patrols are still uh, uh, returning and in the process of reporting. Uh, SMM patrols have visited the sites of the alleged damage to Gindergarten and railway station uh, in the government controlled part of Staniska Luhansk. At the Kindergarten, the SMM saw fresh damage to its facade. Uh, of course, the details uh, will be reported uh, after uh, all the corroboration effort has been completed, and we will do it as soon as possible because we are aware of the importance of uh, these reports in reducing the tensions uh, in the area. Uh, in Marinka and Taramchuk, where there were allegations, uh, SMM itself didn't register ceasefire violations, and we are going to follow up. We are actually following up the allegations that reached to us. Uh, but it is important uh, that the sides are called uh, to reduce tensions and cease fire, and also uh, they do themselves uh, being mindful of the high tensions in the region. I thank you very much. Yeah, look at that. I thank His Excellency Mr. Chevik for his briefing. I now give the floor to Ms. Tatiana Montian. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, ma'am. This is the technician. Can you please unmute your microphone? Ma'am, your microphone is still muted. Please unmute your microphone. Слышно? We can hear you. Now. Good morning, once again, ladies and gentlemen. I do hope you can hear me. 
I uh, listened very carefully to everything that was said by the speakers before me, and I would like to say to you this. I am completely certain that you all know very well that never, ever, ever the authorities in Kiev had the intention of implementing either the first uh, package of Minsk agreements and much less so the second Minsk agreements. This is simply a pause to be able to say, yes, we're going to implement that. In the meantime, uh, we'll receive weapons from NATO, our armed forces will become stronger, and we do hope that in some time later we will be able to uh, get back uh, the rebellious republics by force. It's not only they do not want to talk to the republics, and this was said by Zelensky directly just now. He said that he sees no reason to have dialogue with Donetsk and Luhansk. They do not want to have conversations with the uh, civil society, even within Ukraine. People who do not want uh, to go to Europe or NATO, people who are against the coup d'etat, who want to live in peace and uh, friendship in Russia and other countries. These people, not only are they not represented within Ukrainian politics at all, they are being criminally prosecuted. I'm a criminal lawyer. Ruslan Kataba simply posted a video on YouTube saying that he is in favor of peace and against war in Donbass. And he has been trial since 2015, and the accusation is high treason. I went to Donbass personally to visit one of the commanders, now dead, Mr. Moskovoy, so as to, 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 to take a detainee back. And I saw a huge number of people whose only uh, fault is uh, that they're against Maidan, against coup d'etat, against NATO and Europe. And you now want to tell me that those people who sit in judgment over others' people or other people's because uh, they have placed a like in social in social um, networks. People who closed all opposition channels, who are prosecuting all opposition politics, that these people are going to hold conversation with Donetsk and Luhansk, it is very clear that this is in principle an a possibility. This would, this is a matter and anti-matter. They annihilate each other. So what is the problem? What was the difficulty to provide a special status uh, in the past five years. They are not going to do that because any uh, different thinking in Ukraine is being squashed. People who are in Ukraine against Maidan, against the coup d'etat, against war, the enemies of the people. They have no right to take the floors anywhere, anywhere at all. They have no political parties. They have no uh, civil society associations. They have no right to speak the, in, in their country. They don't have that right at all. And of course, even after that, how can you ask that Kiev be talking to Lugansk and Donetsk? I am sure you understand that this will never, ever, ever happen. One of the previous speakers said, uh, well, that I would, uh, I regret that despite the efforts of Germany and France, the Kiev regime does not want to implement the uh, Kiev agreements. I'm certain that the West allows the Kiev regime to non-implement. If this were not the case, all of the Minsk agreements would have been implemented a long time ago. Please do not say that Kiev is an independent entity here, that uh, Ukraine is independent. It is a colony of a collective West where everything is decided by the people who came in from the outside, who organized the Maidan and the could and plunged my country into slavery. And these are the same people stand in the way of implementing the Minsk agreement. 
and they will not allow the agreements to be implemented. I'm certain of it, because the real goal of the West, despite all the peace-loving speeches I've heard, including here, is to make sure that Kiev attacks the republics and the Russia is bogged into this war. No explanation for the Western hysterics when they say that Russia is about to invade. And Biden just said, I just listened to it as we were having this meeting. That's what he said. There is no other goal that the West has. The only goal is to organize war. If this were not the case, then the mm, puppet government of Ukraine would have been compelled to implement the Minsk agreements a long time ago. And since this is not taking place, then we can state one thing and one thing only. The West wants a war with Russia. And the ones it wants a war to take place on the territory of Ukraine. We are not a chessboard. We are a people of Ukraine. And the, the people in the unrecognized republics is, are simply pawns in political games. There's nothing else that can be said here. And I am sure that you yourselves understand that very well. I'm very happy that I had the opportunity to say this to your face. I am convinced that you will lead the events uh, to a war. The events today in the Republic, in the republics, when they were shelled throughout the contact line, have convinced me of that completely. Ukraine, the Kiev regime, for almost eight years, have been shelling about 100,000 people using heavy artillery. OSC have the moniker of blind observers in the territories react to this not at all. That uh, side which is under the control of the Kiev regime, children are not uh, killed. Not a single child has been killed and, and buildings are standing up. The, this only happens in the unrecognized republic and I visited them personally. I am telling you this about firsthand because I traveled down the entire contact line and I saw how peaceful civilians, unprotected, vulnerable people are being killed. The people who did not manage to leave, their old people, their women with children or their handicapped. Those who could have left, left the area a long time ago. So these uh, long-suffering people are hostages there, and they're in the number of 100,000. And the entire Europe is, for the eighth year running, looking duplicitously at the suffering of these people, whilst at the same time saying that there is no alternative to the Minsk agreements. Well, fine, then complete, com compel your marionettes from the Kiev regime to implement them and plea or stop saying that there is no alternative to them. I thank you for your attention. I thank uh, Ms. Tatiana Manchan for her briefing. I will now make a statement in my capacity as Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. We would like to thank uh, for their assessments and views uh, Under Secretary General Rosemary De Carlo, Special Representative of the OSC chairperson in office in Ukraine in the trilateral contact group and the chief monitor of the OEC special monitoring session, Mr. Chevik. And we are grateful to Ms. Tatiana Manchan for her valuable information firsthand about how the Security Council decisions on implementing inter-Ukrainian conflict are being implemented in practice. The date of the meeting today is not random. This is a day when seven years ago the Security Council of the United Nations passed Resolution 2202 and it unanimously adopted the package of measures for the implementation of the Minsk Agreement as the only international legal basis to settle the civil conflict in the east of Ukraine. And that is why the main goal for the meeting 
today we see in reaffirming by the Security Council of the fact that there is no alternative to this momentous for Ukraine um, document. Unfortunately, seven years down the road, we are increasingly thinking that the implementation of the Minsk agreements is not something that in the plan that's in the plans of our Ukrainian neighbors. They're stating that op openly now. Let me give you some examples. As recently as yesterday, the Vice Prime Minister of Ukraine, Irina Veshuk, stated that there will be no new laws on the special status of Donbass, so no direct agreements. And this took place after Zelensky had a meeting with Chancellor Schultz. She also uh, acknowledged that there is no pressure exerted by West on them to implement the Minsk agreements. On the 4th of February, there was an interview by the Ukrainian Channel 1 plus 1 by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Kuleba. He said that the Minsk agreement cannot be implemented in Russian terms, and in those terms, he thinks there's a direct dialogue between Ukraine and uh, Donbass, despite the fact that this is clearly stated in the package of measures. This uh, same idea was expressed by the head of presidential uh, Ukrainian presidential administration, Yermak, at the recent uh, meeting in Normandy. Earlier, on the 2nd of February, Mr. Kuleba said that no Ukrainian region will have a veto right on the state decision. This is cast in stone, so there will be no special status, as uh, Russia says, no veto. One day earlier, on the 1st of February, Zelensky also recalled for the world entire uh, of Ukraine's inability to negotiate. Um, he hinted at an alternative uh, solution to the conflict in Donbass and says that in in Kiev have a different view to the order of the implementing the provisions of the Minsk Agreement. On the 31st of January, in the interview to the Associated Press, the Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council stated that the implementation of the Minsk Agreement means destroying of the country. They were assigned at the barrel of Russian guns, uh, and Germans and, and the French looked on, and everyone, every rational, rational person understood that the implementation is impossible. Ukrainian politics are trying to implant the opinion in the West that the Minsk agreements are against the national interest of Ukraines. But if the goal of building peace on their own land is part of the national interest of Ukraine, well, such statements are out of place. Another excuse that we hear here is that Russia is not implementing some of its obligations in the Minsk agreements. And it is very possible that this is something that we'll also hear here today. Um, at the same time, it's obvious that there are absolutely no grounds for that because there is no mention of Russia in the text of the, in the Minsk agreements. Let me just give you one opinion on this, uh, not by anyone, but by a judge from the um, Constitutional Court of Ukraine. He very recently proposed opening criminal prosecution against um, those who participated in the working out of Minsk agreements, Leonid Kuchma and Petra Poroshenko. And the reason, he says, and I quote, Minsk provides for 20 obligations placed on Ukraine, six on OSCE, two on Donbass, and not a single one for Russia. End of quote. Colleagues, please allow me to, yet once again, very briefly recall the contents of the document we're discussing at this meeting of ours. Let me list it item by item. And the order in which they are to be implemented is very clearly stated. It cannot be changed. First, ceasefire. Second, withdrawal of weapons. Three, OEC monitoring. Four, launching a dialogue between Kiev and Donbass. Five, amnesty. Six, exchange of detainees. Seven, humanitarian access. Eight, lifting uh, the economic bl blockade. Nine, transfer to the Kiev border control provided um, item 11 is implemented. Ten, withdrawal of uh, foreign formations and mercenaries. Eleven, new constitutions providing special status for Donbass. Twelve, agreeing on the order of conducting elections. And thirteen, intensifying the work of the contact group in Minsk. Seven years down the road, it is clear that none of the provisions of the package of measures have been implemented by Ukraine in full, starting with the first one, ceasefire. And the root of the problem here is systematic lack of desire of Kiev to get into a direct dialogue with the authorized representative of Donetsk in Luhansk in the contact group, whereas this is a dialogue that is clearly 
directly provided in items 4, 9, 11, and 12 of the document. This is not our requirement. This is something that is stated in the document. It's an obligation on Ukraine. And this is something that our neighbors increasingly bring into question and thus uh, um, risk um, undermine the whole Minsk process, which could lead to devastating consequences for Ukraine. Ukraine stubbornly refuses to implement the provisions of the uh, of the of, of the Minsk on direct dialogue with Donbass, um, interim uh, self-governance, restoring um, socioeconomic links, constitutional reform. And currently, the Verkhovna Rada has a draft on decentralization. It's not agreed with Donbass, and it does not provide for a special status. Ukrainian side um, has taken course to completely move away from a direct interaction with Donbass within the coordination mechanism. And they are providing various um, options, but they do not allow for effective reaction in case of violations. Attempts to place the blame on Russia are futile and baseless. And this only hides uh, the goal of shifting the blame away from Ukraine. Um, and I must say that we are very disappointed by the ostrich-like position of our Western colleagues who are trying not to see obvious things. We are surprised that they're putting into uh, the shadow of the men's complex of measures, but they are placing the emphasis on the normat format. I'd like to recall the normat format, according to Annex 2 of the resolution, is a mechanism to control implementation, but not a place where new decisions could be discussed. For seven years, Russia has been calling in all platforms to for the Western um, sponsors to exert pressure on Kiev to implement the Minsk uh, agreements. Um, uh, they were doing, and they were doing exactly the opposite. So the increasing feeling of impunity pushed the Ukrainian hotheads to new excuses and military adventures against their own people. And this is what we have. We have thousands uh, of uh, victims of the internal armed conflict. Many millions in Donbass are still uh, presented as foreigners in their, their own country. They have uh, automatic rifles, sniper rifles, howitzers, and um, strike drones uh, targeted at them. Ukrainian representatives uh, are keep coming up with new excuses not to Im implement other agreements and uh, um, order to shell their own people. There is an alley of angels, a memorial complex in Donetsk to commemorate the children who died um, for, uh, at the hands of um, Ukrainian military. Those who died at the children's beach in Zurgus on the 13th of August, it was targeted by the Air Force of Ukraine. 20 people died, dozens were wounded. A 24-year-old Anastasia Rubin, a local, was, was there with her son at the time when the Ukrainian Air Force started shelling the town from their multiple rocket launch system. One of the um, charges exploded right next to them. Everything was covered in blood and smoke and uh, bloodied bodies of children. This and other similar episodes were compiled by the Investigative Committee of Russia and the uh, um, RT Media in a compilation. Um, showing the Ukrainian uh, military using prohibited means or ways of m means. And our UN mission have compiled that and disseminated this to members of the Security Council. Please take a look at them. You will be horrified by them. The um, Kiev's commitment to the complex of measures can also be um, um, illustrated by the abduction last year. Um, in Lugansk from the Joint Center on Congregation Control, Control of Andrea Kosak. Mr. Kinunen, we would be very grateful if you could tell us about this episode. This is a treacherous uh, event, and it is a direct violation of Item 5 of the Compact Measures, which prohibits the prosecution and punishment of persons in connection with the events in Donetsk and Luhansk. Colleagues, I would like to finally say that you will be able to resist the temptation to play to the cameras 
and will not make this meeting of ours into a circus, will not present here baseless accusations saying that Russia allegedly was going to attack Ukraine. I think we've had enough speculation on that, including uh, the Security um, Council meeting on the 31st of January convened by the United States. We have long ago clarified everything and explained everything, and the um, um, announced date of the so-called invasion is behind us, so therefore I'm, my advice to you is not present yourself in an awkward situation. I thank you for your attention. And now I resume my function as President of the Council, and I now give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State of the United States of America. Mr. President, this Council was convened today to discuss the implementation of the Minsk Agreements, a goal that we all share despite Russia's persistent violations. These agreements, which were negotiated in 2014 and 2015 and signed by Russia, remain the basis for the peace process to resolve the conflict in eastern Ukraine. This Council's primary responsibility, the very reason for its creation, is the preservation of peace and security. As we meet today, the most immediate threat to peace and security is Russia's looming aggression against Ukraine. The stakes go far beyond Ukraine. This is a moment of peril for the lives and safety of millions of people, as well as for the foundation of the United Nations Charter and the rules-based international order that preserves stability worldwide. This crisis directly affects every member of this Council and every country in the world. Because the basic principles that sustain peace and security, principles that were enshrined in the wake of two world wars and a Cold War, are under threat. The principle that one country cannot change the borders of another by force. The principle that one country cannot dictate another's choices or policies or with whom it will associate the principle of national sovereignty. This is the exact kind of crisis that the United Nations, and specifically this Security Council, was created to prevent. We must address what Russia is doing right now to Ukraine. Over the past months, without provocation or justification, Russia has amassed more than 150,000 troops around Ukraine's borders, in Russia, Belarus occupied Crimea. Russia says it's drawing down those forces. We do not see that happening on the ground. Our information indicates clearly that these forces, including ground troops, aircraft, ships, are preparing to launch an attack against Ukraine in the coming days. We don't know precisely how things will play out. But here's what the world can expect to see unfold. In fact, it's unfolding right now, today, as Russia takes steps down the path to war and reissued the threat of military action. First, Russia plans to manufacture a pretext for its attack. This could be a violent event that Russia will blame on Ukraine or an outrageous accusation that Russia will level against the Ukrainian government. We don't know exactly the form it will take. It could be a fabricated so-called terrorist bombing inside Russia, the invented discovery of a mass grave, a staged drone strike against civilians, or a fake, even a real, attack using chemical weapons. Russia may describe this event as ethnic cleansing or a genocide, making a mockery of a concept that we in this chamber do not take lightly nor do I take lightly, based on my family history. In the past few days, Russian media has already begun to spread some of these false alarms and claims to maximize public outrage, to lay the groundwork for an invented justification for war. Today, that drumbeat is only intensified in Russia's state-controlled media. We've heard some of these basic allegations from Russian-backed speakers here today. Second, in response to this manufactured provocation, 
the highest levels of the Russian government may theatrically convene emergency meetings to address the so-called crisis. The government will issue proclamations declaring that Russia must respond to defend Russian citizens or ethnic Russians in Ukraine. Next, the attack is planned to begin. Russian missiles and bombs will drop across Ukraine. Communications will be jammed. Cyber attacks will shut down key Ukrainian institutions. After that, Russian tanks and soldiers will advance on key targets that have already been identified and mapped out in detailed plans. We believe these targets include Russia's capital, uh, Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, a city of 2.8 million people. And conventional attacks are not all that Russia plans to inflict upon the people of Ukraine. We have information that indicates Russia will target specific groups of Ukrainians. We've been warning the Ukrainian government of all that is coming. And here today, we are laying it out in great detail with the hope that by sharing what we know with the world, we can influence Russia to abandon the path of war and choose a different path while there's still time. Now, I'm mindful that some have called into question our information, recalling previous instances where intelligence ultimately did not bear out. But let me be clear. I am here today not to start a war, but to prevent one. The information I presented here is validated by what we've seen unfolding in plain sight before our eyes for months. And remember that while Russia has repeatedly derided our warnings and alarms as melodrama and nonsense, they have been steadily amassing more than 150,000 troops on Ukraine's borders, as well as the capabilities to conduct a massive military assault. It isn't just us seeing this. Allies and partners see the same thing. And Russia hasn't only been hearing from us. The international chorus has grown louder and louder. If Russia doesn't invade Ukraine, then we will be relieved that Russia changed course and proved our predictions wrong. That would be a far better outcome than the course we're currently on. And we'll gladly accept any criticism that anyone directs at us. As President Biden said, this would be a war of choice. And if Russia makes that choice, we've been clear, along with allies and partners, that our response will be sharp and decisive. President Biden reiterated that forcefully earlier this week. There's another choice Russia can still make if there's any truth to its claim that it's committed to diplomacy. Diplomacy is the only responsible way to resolve this crisis. An essential part of this is through implementation of the Minsk agreements, the subject of our session today. There are a series of commitments that Russia and Ukraine made under Minsk, with the OSCE and the Normandy Format partners involved as well. If Russia is prepared to sit with the Ukrainian government and work through the process of implementing these commitments, our friends in France and Germany stand ready to convene senior level discussions in the Normandy Format to settle these issues. Ukraine is ready for this, and we stand fully ready to support the parties. Progress toward resolving the Donbass crisis through the Minsk agreements can reinforce the broader discussions on security issues that we're prepared to engage in with Russia in coordination with our allies and partners. More than three weeks ago, we provided Russia with a paper that detailed concrete reciprocal steps that we can take in the near term to address our respective concerns and advance the collective security interests of Russia, the United States, and our European partners and allies. This morning, we received a response, which we're evaluating. Earlier today, I sent a letter to Russia's Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, proposing that we meet next week in Europe, following on our talks in recent weeks, to discuss the steps that we can take to resolve this crisis without conflict. We're also proposing meetings of the NATO-Russia Council and the OSCE Permanent Council. These meetings can pave the way for a summit of key leaders in the context of de-escalation 
to reach understandings on our mutual security concerns. As lead diplomats for our nations, we have a responsibility to make every effort for diplomacy to succeed, to leave no diplomatic stone unturned. If Russia is committed to diplomacy, we're presenting every opportunity for it to demonstrate that commitment. I have no doubt that the response to my remarks here today will be more dismissals from the Russian government about the United States stoking hysteria or that it has no plans to invade Ukraine. So let me make this simple. The Russian government can announce today with no qualification, equivocation, or deflection that Russia will not invade Ukraine. State it clearly, state it plainly to the world, and then demonstrate it by sending your troops, your tanks, your planes back to their barracks and hangars and sending your diplomats to the negotiating table. In the coming days, the world will remember that commitment or the refusal to make it. I yield the floor. Yeah. I thank His Excellency, Secretary of State of the United States, Mr. Blinken, and I now give the floor to Minister of State for Europe and North America of the United Kingdom and Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Mr. James Cleverly. I thank you and I thank the briefers for the information they've given today. The United Nations, the OSCE and the mandate of the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission continue to command our full support. The rights of all Ukrainian, whether they are in Kyiv, Lviv, Donetsk, Luhansk, can only be served by peace, diplomacy and dialogue. I want to make absolutely clear the United Kingdom's support for the implementation of the Minsk agreements as endorsed by the UN Security Council Resolution 2202. That resolution reaffirmed the Security Council's full respect for the sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity of Ukraine. It remains the responsibility of all parties to implement fully their commitments and to seek a peaceful resolution to the conflict. In this respect, we condemn the actions taken by the Russian Duma to propose the Russian president recognize the regions of Luhansk and Donetsk as independent. This would directly undermine the Minsk agreements and must be rejected by the Russian authorities in line with the commitments that they have made. We welcome all efforts to support the process and to avoid escalation, including the role of the OSCE and the Normandy format. This remains our long-standing position. Mr. President, let us remind ourselves of the context for the Minsk, Minsk agreements and the situation in which Ukraine finds itself today. In March 2014, Russia invaded and illegally annexed Crimea in flagrant violation of international law. A few weeks later, in April, Russia instigated a conflict in the Donbass, which it continues to fuel today. More than 14,000 people have lost their lives in the fighting there. Now, today, the Ukrainian people are yet again living under the threat of invasion, with well over 130,000 Russian troops heavy weaponry and military vessels amassed and exercising on their northern, eastern and southern borders from Belarus to the Black Sea. Let us say clearly what the whole world can see. Russia has deployed the forces necessary to invade Ukraine and now has them readied for action. In the past days, we have heard Russian claims that some units are returning to barracks. It is, however, all too clear that the opposite is in fact true, 
and the Russian military build-up continues. Russia will say that it has the right to move its forces within its own territory, but no one has the right to threaten the use of force. Russia is patently failing to live up to the international commitments that it has made around military transparency by refusing to adequately explain its military build-up or provide the necessary transparency to build trust and to de-escalate the situation. If the Kremlin is serious about a diplomatic resolution, then it needs to show up to the diplomatic meetings and commit to meaningful OSCE talks, including via Chapter 3 of the OSCE Vienna document. They did not show up on Wednesday, and they do not intend to show up on Friday. Russia's actions are clearly designed to intimidate, to threaten, and to destabilize Ukraine. We know it, they know it, and the international community knows it. Mr. President, Russia called this meeting today to discuss Resolution 2202. That text is very clear on two points that reflect the core tenets of the Charter emphasized by the United Nations Secretary General when he addressed this situation only a few days ago. One, that resolving the situation in eastern regions of Ukraine can only be achieved by peaceful means. And two, that there must be full respect for the sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Yet, we are seeing increasing disinformation about events in the Donbass that are straight out of the Kremlin playbook. A blatant attempt by the Russian government to fabricate a pretext for the invasion of Ukraine. It is therefore clear that we are at a critical juncture to prevent further escalation. Upholding the core tenets of the Charter in respect of peaceful resolution and respecting sovereignty and territorial integrity has never been more important. Russia must now engage with the diplomatic process we have built up over several decades and on which global security depends and resolve this situation through peaceful means. If Russia chooses to launch an attack at this time of heightened tension, using disinformation of a pretext, it will show that Russia was never serious about diplomatic engagement. Any Russian invasion now would be a conflict of choice for President Putin and an abdication of Russia's responsibility under the UN Charter to refrain from the use of force and to maintain international peace and security. There should be no doubt that any further Russian incursion into Ukraine would be a massive strategic mistake and a humanitarian disaster that will be met with strength, including significant coordinated sanctions. And we will continue to call out the pattern of deception and disinformation from the Russian state. But if Russia is serious about the Charter and its role as a permanent member of this Council, it should give the Minsk agreements the chance to be implemented, free from coercion. It should engage seriously with diplomacy and it should stand down all of its troops. There is still time to change path. Conflict can be avoided. And we urge Russia to match its words with actions, to withdraw its troops, to engage meaningfully in talks and to act in the best interest of peace and security and stability in Europe. I thank you. I thank His Excellency Mr. Cleverly for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Norway. Thank you, President, and I thank the briefers for their statements. Let me also use this opportunity to thank all personnel at the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine. 
They contribute on a daily basis to reducing tensions and fostering peace, stability and security on the ground. The threatening security situation in and around Ukraine is alarming. Norway is deeply concerned by Russian large-scale military buildup in occupied Crimea to the north, east and south of Ukraine, as well as in Belarus and the Black Sea. The alleged reports of increased shelling are disturbing. They must not be used as a pretext for any military action. Norway calls on Russia to de-escalate and to engage in dialogue constructively and in good faith through established international mechanisms. It remains a major obstacle that Russia falsely seeks to portray the conflict in eastern Ukraine as an internal Ukrainian conflict. The reality is that Russia has fueled the conflict by providing financial and military support to the armed formations it backs. President, Norway expresses strong concern regarding the resolution of the Russian State Duma calling for the recognition of the self-proclaimed People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. We warn against such a step, which would constitute a further violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and directly contradict the spirit and the letter of the Minsk agreements. Norway supports the negotiations in the Normandy format and in the trilateral contact group aimed at ending the conflict through a political settlement and implementation of the Minsk agreements. Norway calls on the parties to uphold their commitments and to engage constructively towards resolving the conflict by peaceful means. We welcome the OSCE chairmanship's renewed European security dialogue initiative. We encourage Russia to engage in this format. We also urge Russia to respect its commitments under the Vienna document and contribute to a constructive dialogue and exchange under Chapter 3. Norway upholds a European security order based on international law and national sovereignty and territorial integrity. These principles have repeatedly been invoked by Russia in Council discussions. Norway calls on Russia to respect these principles when it comes to Ukraine. President, through threatening posture and rhetoric and unrealistic demands, Russia is challenging European security. Every country has the right to freely choose its security alignment. We cannot allow the established security architecture to be replaced by spheres of influence. We're concerned that the ceasefire in Donbass from July 2020 has become increasingly fragile. We call on the parties to seek a durable ceasefire and do their utmost to prevent civilian casualties. The humanitarian situation is severe after eight years of conflict. Civilians are increasingly losing access to essential life-saving services as civilian infrastructure is damaged and destroyed. Any escalation of the conflict would lead to devastating humanitarian consequences. Let me conclude by reiterating Norway's unwavering support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its international recognized borders in accordance with the principles and purposes of the UN Charter. This includes the Crimean Peninsula and its territorial waters. I thank you. Yeah. I thank the representative of Norway for her statement. And now I'll give the floor to the representative of Brazil. Thank you. Mr. President, Brazil follows with concern the situation in eastern Ukraine. Persistent political stalemate and prolonged crisis have reached a critical point. In present circumstances, renewed and reinvigorated political resolve by all parties is crucial to address the conflict. Achieving and maintaining peace is our collective responsibility. We appreciate the ongoing political and diplomatic efforts aiming to restore peace and stability in Ukraine and the wider region. We firmly believe a diplomatic solution 
must be found to the crisis, and we will continue to support credible initiatives to bring a peaceful, a peaceful settlement to it. We reiterate our understanding that Resolution 2202 provides the general guidelines for a peaceful solution to the situation and a permanent stability in Eastern Ukraine. Unfortunately, Resolution 2202 has not been fully implemented. Brazil urges all parties to, to fulfill the letter and the spirit of the Minsk agreements. We urge concerned parties to pursue genuine dialogue on the implementation of Security Resolution 2202, which provides the parameters not only to address the situation in eastern Ukraine, but also to assist diplomatic efforts to overcome the current security challenges in the region. Brazil also welcomes the resumption of talks in the Normandy format and calls for renewed commitment to find ways for a lasting peace in eastern Ukraine. A comprehensive ceasefire, which is the first point of the Minsk agreements, remains an essential element in this process. Beyond that, we need further disengagement of forces and military equipment on the ground. This disengagement must allow unimpeded access of humanitarian re relief to people in most desperate need. Furthermore, trust among relevant parties is crucial to strengthening dialogue and achieving a sustainable solution. Negotiations on the parameters to grant special status to certain areas of Don Donetsk and Lushkank regions must be conducted with a sense of urgency. Flexibility and the spirit of compromise. The implementation of the Minsk agreements must observe full respect for the sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity of Ukraine. All parties must bear in mind the letter of the agreements. We firmly believe that the Security Council has the utmost responsibility to avoid and condemn any attempt of a military solution to this crisis. Dialogue and negotiation are the only way forward to a lasting peace. We urge all parties to take the necessary measures to de-escalate tensions and play a constructive role in reaching a political settlement to the Ukrainian crisis in accordance with international law, particularly the UN Charter. I thank you. Yeah, I thank the representative of Brazil for his statement. I give the floor to the representative of Ireland. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I also want to say a special thank you to Under Secretary General Di Carlo and to Ambassadors Kinnunen and Cevic today for their helpful and uh, informative briefings. And I'd like to also recognize the presence of high level participants at this council this morning, Mr. President. As I begin my remarks, it's important that I'm clear, Ireland is a steadfast and consistent supporter of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders. Ireland believes in and is fully committed to the core principles enshrined in the UN Charter. These include the sovereign equal equality and territorial integrity of states. Ukraine has the same fundamental right as every other sovereign and independent state to choose its own foreign policy and to ensure the security and defense of its territory. That is a right we hold to be self-evident. It's the right that Ireland struggled to obtain. As Russia's military buildup at Ukraine's border continues to raise tensions, Ireland again calls for calm, de-escalation and the pursuit of diplomacy. 
we need to see sustained and credible moves on the ground toward de-escalation. Genuine de-escalation will imply a significant withdrawal of both troops and equipment. We commend all who are engaged in dialogue, including through the Normandy format and Poland as OSCE chair in office, for launching a renewed European security dialogue. We support urgent, constructive and resolute engagement through all diplomatic channels. President, the full implementation of Minsk peace agreements and the related conflict resolution efforts in the Normandy format and trilateral contact group are important priorities for us. There is no doubt that we are now at a sensitive moment. Today, we call on all parties to act constructively within both formats. In this regard, we deeply regret the decision of the Russian State Duma to submit a call to recognize as independent entities the non-government controlled areas in the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts of Ukraine. This would be a clear violation of the Minsk agreements. We are also concerned at reports of alleged shelling today in eastern Ukraine, as mentioned by Special Representative Kinnanen, which would also be a violation of the Minsk agreements. Mr. President, all signatories of the Minsk agreements agreed on the need for the OSCE's special monitoring mission safe and secure access to the entire territory of Ukraine. The mandate of the SMM was agreed by all 57 OSCE participating states. We therefore remain very concerned at the continuing restrictions imposed on the SMM's freedom of movement. We also regret that SMM equipment has been damaged or interfered with. I want to express our deep regret at the decision by the Russian Federation to refuse to extend the mandate of the Border Observer Mission to monitor the border crossings. We commend the tireless efforts of Ambassadors Kinnanen and Chevik in the Trilateral Contact Group. We see the agreement reached by the group at the end of last year on adherence to the July 2020 ceasefire as an important achievement and a sign that there can be progress if there is genuine political will. President, Eastern Ukraine has already endured eight years of conflict resulting in humanitarian disaster, serious human rights violations and abuses as reported by the OHCHR. Just as we know that further conflict is not inevitable, we know too that wherever conflict occurs, it is civilians who bear the brunt. Ireland therefore sincerely calls on all sides to work peacefully toward an effective and sustainable political settlement of the conflict and to jumpstart that work today. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank for her statement, the representative of Ireland, and I give the floor to the representative of India. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me begin by thanking Under Secretary General Rosemary Di Carlo, Special Representative Mikko Kinunen and Chief Monitor Yesha Chevik for their comprehensive briefings on the occasion of the seventh anniversary of the package of measures for the implementation of the Minsk agreements endorsed unanimously by the UN Security Council Resolution 2202. I also welcome Ms. Tatiana Montian to our meeting. We welcome the efforts underway for implementation of the Minsk agreements, including through the Trilateral Contact Group and under the Normandy format. We believe that Minsk agreements provides a basis for a negotiated and peaceful settlement of the situation in eastern Ukraine. Accordingly, we urge all parties to continue to engage through all possible diplomatic channels and keep working towards the full implementation of the Minsk agreements. We also believe that meetings under the Normandy format will further facilitate the implementation of the provisions of the Minsk agreements, including its key security and political aspects. In this context, we welcome the recent meetings of the political advisors 
of the Normandy format countries in Paris and Berlin. We also welcome the unconditional observance of the July 2020 ceasefire, the reaffirmation of Minsk agreements as the basis of work under the Normandy format, and the commitment of all sides to reduce disagreements on the way forward. Any steps that increase tension may best be avoided by all sides in the larger interest of securing international peace and security. Quiet and constructive diplomacy is the need of the hour. India has been in touch with all concerned parties. It is our considered view that the issue can only be resolved through diplomatic dialogue. India's interest is in finding a solution that can provide for immediate de-escalation of tensions, taking into account the legitimate security interests of all countries and aim towards securing long-term peace and stability in the region and beyond. More than 20,000 Indian students and nationals live and study in different parts of Ukraine, including in its border areas. The well-being of Indian nationals is of priority to us. In conclusion, we reiterate our call for the peaceful resolution of the situation by sincere and sustained diplomatic efforts to ensure that concerns of all sides are amicably resolved through constructive dialogue. I thank you. I thank the representative of India for his statement. I give the floor to the representative of Kenya. Thank you, Mr. President. We thank the Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, the Special Representative of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission Chief Monitor for their briefings. Kenya cannot contemplate the continued insecurity in Eastern Ukraine and the impact it can have on broader security in Europe. Global security is intertwined. Instability in Europe, beyond threatening lives and economies, also disrupts the ability of this important region to play a constructive role in solving the most pressing challenges globally. Insufficient progress in the implementation of the Minsk agreements has been realized since 2014, and that needs to change. Kenya wants to offer three brief recommendations. In doing so, we hope that they will contribute to a renewed push by all relevant stakeholders to stabilize a situation that left to escalate threatens the very foundations of global stability and the Security Council's ability to fulfill its mandate in multiple conflict situations. First, Kenya maintains that the respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of all countries by all states is a cornerstone of global peace. If multilateralism is to be reborn into a system that delivers sustained peace to all, the most powerful states must consistently adhere to international law and to the respect of the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries in all regions at all times. We therefore strongly urge all actors to respect the peace, security, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of Ukraine. The people of Ukraine deserve inclusive governance, peace, and a vibrant economy, which are all deeply dependent on regional stability and cooperation. Second, as we indicated on the 31st of January in this chamber, we believe that this standoff is imminently solvable. Major military powers, particularly those represented in the Security Council, must make a specific and sustained effort to reach arrangements that deliver a minimum level of deconfliction and mutual respect. Otherwise, third countries and global peace and security will suffer greatly as a result of their confrontations. Third, Kenya reiterates the obligations of all the parties to fully implement their commitments in accordance with the Minsk agreements, which provide the most promising roadmap for the peaceful settlement of the current hostilities, including in eastern Ukraine. All parties must take responsibility and reflect that responsibility in a new willingness to agree to compromise. 
Kenya welcomes the Normandy Format Advisors meeting held earlier this month and the follow-up meeting which is scheduled for next month on implementing the Minsk Accords and the consensus reached at the Group Leader Summit in Paris in December 2019. We commend the diplomatic leaders of the Russian Federation and the United States and their partners and allies for showing a willingness to meet in the coming days to make further progress. Thank you. I thank the representative of Kenya for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of the United Arab Emirates. Thank you, Mr. President. At the outset, I would like to thank Mrs. Rosie Mary De Carlo, Under Secretary General for Political Affairs and Peace Building, and Mr. Miko Kanunan, Special Representative of the OSCE Chairperson in Office in Ukraine. and in the Trilateral Contact Group, and Mr. Yashar Halit Shafiq, the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission Chief Monitor for their comprehensive uh, briefings. We've also took note of the Ukrainian civil society activist, Mrs. Tetiana Maltian. Mr. President, since our meeting on January 31st, we have seen intensive diplomatic efforts at various levels including at the highest levels, to reduce the current tensions in Eastern Europe. We also welcome the further engagement within the Normandy format and hope that these discussions will continue. Such structured formats, particularly those bringing together Russia and Ukraine along with other stakeholders, are important for furthering dialogue and reducing tensions. This would also help us to find a peaceful and sustainable solution that would tackle all security concerns of all parties. In this regard, my country stresses the need to maintain the current momentum and diplomatic efforts that need to be built up, in particular through uh, steps taken by all concerned parties to engage in constructive dialogue in the interest of de-escalation and the maintenance of regional security and stability. We stress the importance of implementing the Minsk agreements in full and in good faith by all parties. We'd also like to refer to Security Council Resolution 2202. In this context, we urge all stakeholders to avoid steps that would make implementation of the Minsk agreements more difficult. We also note the important role of the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine, whose presence supports efforts for dialogue and confidence building between the parties. It also contributes to easing tensions. At the same time, we must pay attention to the critical situation of civilians in eastern Ukraine, where United Nations reports mentioned that there are 3.4 million people in need of humanitarian assistance, of whom 55% are women and 16% children. Furthermore, there are obstacles for the delivery of humanitarian assistance to some of those in need, particularly in areas near the contact line in eastern Ukraine. We therefore emphasize the importance of not escalating existing tensions, as this may cause serious harm to civilians. In this regard, we call upon all parties not to obstruct the access to humanitarian aid or the movement of civilians in conflict areas in accordance with their obligations under international law. Finally, we reiterate the importance of respecting international law and the Charter of the United Nations, particularly the principles of territorial integrity, sovereignty and good neighborliness, as they are essential references for resolving the current crisis and calming tensions in the region. In conclusion, Mr. President, the UAE reiterates the importance of constructive dialogue and to continue effort to reach peaceful solutions consistent with international law and the Charter of the United Nations. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United Arab Emirates for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Ghana. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'd like to begin by thanking USG Rosemary DiCarlo for her briefing on the prevailing situation in eastern Ukraine as it relates to the implementation of the Minsk Agreement, as well as Mr. Miko Kununin, the Special Representative of the OSCE, Chairperson of the Office in Ukraine, and the Trilateral Contact Group, and Mr. Yasser Halit Shevik, Chief Monitor of the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission in Ukraine, for highlighting the efforts of the OSCE in facilitating the political and diplomatic settlements of the Ukraine, of, of the conflict in eastern Ukraine. We have taken note also of the views expressed by Mrs. Ms. Tatiana Montian, um, as a civil society representative from Ukraine. I further welcome the participation of the representatives of Germany and Ukraine in this meeting. Mr. President, in welcoming today's discussion, which enabled the Council to take stock of the package of measures for the implementation of the Minsk Agreement, adopted on 12 February 2015, my delegation recalls the adoption of Resolution 2202, wherein the Security Council expressed its firm conviction that the crisis in the eastern regions of Ukraine could only be settled through peaceful means. Seven years after the adoption of Resolution 2202, the Council's obligation for the maintenance of international peace and security requires of it a reiteration of its conviction and support for the processes for the further implementation of the Minsk Agreement. Unfortunately, the Minsk Agreements remain largely unimplemented and the conflict continues to fester in parts of the Donbass region with increasing civilian casualties and deepening vulnerabilities mostly of elderly persons and women-led households. More than 14,000 deaths have been recorded since the conflict in eastern Ukraine began. Several thousands of people have been displaced, and 2.9 million people are presently in need of humanitarian assistance. The implications of the situation in Ukraine on regional as well as international peace and security have also been dire. While recognizing the complex fears and complicated concerns which have been expressed by the parties through the Minsk Agreement, we nonetheless believe that good faith conformity with charter obligations by concerned member states should provide clarity to seize opportunities for supporting continuing dialogue and the engagements required to address the concerns of all parties. In this respect, Ghana is concerned by the increasing tensions along the borders of Ukraine. We recall in this regard the provisions of the Charter which establishes the fundamental norms of the post-1945 international order and require that the international relations of member states should not involve threats of or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of other states. We therefore entreat all parties to maintain the path of dialogue and diplomacy in addressing any differences that exist between and among them. Towards the further implementation of peaceful measures for resolving the crisis in the eastern regions of Ukraine, we make the following points. First, Ghana reaffirms her support for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine, a bona fide member of the United Nations whose membership of this organization provides for her guarantees over her internationally recognized borders. Secondly, we know the security concerns of other member states in Europe, especially those in Eastern Europe, and urge a restraint by all in maintaining the Pacific order in Europe, even as efforts continue to address any concerns with the contemporary European security architecture. Third, we welcome the high-level diplomatic engagements to address existing concerns over the situation in Ukraine, including recent discussions among leaders of the Normandy Four that reaffirm the ceasefire in the eastern region of Ukraine as well as the OSCE facilitated dialogues at different levels. We continue to urge restraint by all sides, call on the parties to bear in mind the prospective outcomes from ongoing escalation, which do not lead to any strategic gain for any party, and encourage efforts to address both immediate and long-term interests through diplomacy and dialogue. Fourth, we urge renewed dialogue within the Normandy 4 process to resolve differences in the interpretation of the sequencing of the package of measures for the implementation of the Minsk agreements. As it is said, how can two go on a journey unless they be agreed on the path they intend to take? 
Faith, we urge the parties to guarantee unimpeded access for humanitarian assistance in both government and non-government controlled areas in line with humanitarian principles and international humanitarian law. We further commend the efforts of humanitarian agencies in Ukraine and welcome the 2022 Humanitarian Response Plan to save lives, ensure access to basic services, and strengthen the protection of those affected by the conflict and COVID-19. Finally, Mr. President, let me conclude by stressing Ghana's support for the renewal of the spirit of the Minsk Agreement. We urge the parties to work in good faith and with flexibility to make necessary concessions for an enduring peace in Ukraine with beneficial outcomes for the rest of the Europe and indeed globally. I thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Ghana for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Mexico. Gracias. Thank you, President. I would like to thank Under Secretary General Di Carlo, Special Representative Kanunen and Ambassador Chevik for their briefings, and we take note of the comments from Madame Montian. We recognize the presence of uh, distinguished high level participants in this meeting, and we welcome the representatives of Ukraine and Germany. The review by this Council of the current status of the Minsk agreements relating to the provinces of Luhansk and Donetsk in the east of Ukraine is taking place in a context of heightened tensions which have led to great concern amongst the international community. This is why we feel it's a matter of urgency, above all, to send out a clear, unequivocal signal of the will of the parties, which will make it possible to reverse the escalation of tensions and open up space for political negotiation, a path which will include three elements, détente, diplomacy, and dialogue. We have taken note with great interest of the announcement with regard to the withdrawal of some troops from the border with Ukraine. Completing this step as soon as possible will generate the trust which is only conveyed through action and which the circumstances demand. And since the only genuine solution is a diplomatic solution, we welcome the willingness that has been displayed by the various stakeholders to continue on the path of dialogue. Mexico recognizes and is grateful for the efforts of world leaders who, having influence which they can bring to bear, have personally become involved in order to try to find a peaceful exit to this crisis, which is able to address the various security concerns in the region. Any solution will mean putting an end to tensions in the east of Ukraine. Eight years into the conflict, the Minsk agreements are still the framework for achieving a negotiated solution. The trilateral contact group and the Normandy format offer this possibility. As we have heard, the conflict in the east of Ukraine has had a serious impact on the civilian population. It is estimated that almost three million people require humanitarian assistance, whilst approximately 1.5 million people are displaced. The population is also facing restrictions on their freedom of movement, which limits access to health and education services. Mexico asks that the freedom of movement for civilians be guaranteed on both sides of the contact line. And we also call upon the parties to facilitate humanitarian access to the area in a secure and unrestricted manner, as well as to guarantee the free movement of the special monitoring mission of the Organization for uh, Security in Europe 
This is essential for the comprehensive implementation of its mandate. We also would like to highlight that mines, undetonated munitions and other explosive artifacts are a real threat and disproportionately affect the civilian population. We call upon the parties to eliminate existing mines and not to proceed to place new explosives. Mr. President, Mexico reiterates its commitment to the, for the respect of the sovereignty, political independence and the territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders in accordance with the United Nations Charter, international law and relevant resolutions of the United Nations. I conclude by stressing that the tensions around the situation in Ukraine and the potential consequences make it very clear, uh, the situation very clear, as the Secretary General has stated. Uh, replacing diplomacy by confrontation would be to take a dive over a cliff. The time has come to endorse efforts channeled in one single direction detente, diplomacy, and dialogue. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Mexico for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative. I thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I thank you for presiding over today's meeting. My thanks also go to USG Rosemary Di Carlo, Ambassador Miko Kinun, Special Representative of the OSCE Chairperson in Office, and Ambassador Khalid Shevik, Chief Monitor of the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission, for their briefings. I also listened carefully to the remarks made by Ms. Tatiana Mountain. February 12th this year marked the seventh anniversary of the New Minsk Agreements. Consideration of the implementation of the new Minsk agreements is the subject of this Council meeting. Universally recognized, the agreements is a fundamental and binding political document for the settlement of the Ukraine issue and was unanimously endorsed by the Security Council in its resolution 2202. Therefore, it deserves complete and effective implementation by all the parties concerned. Regrettably, however, to date, the majority of the agreement's provisions have yet to be truly implemented. New ceasefire violations have occurred on the line of contact. China believes that the effort to resolve the Ukraine issue must, after all, go back to the starting point, that is, the implementation of the new Minsk agreements. We hope that all parties concerned will take a constructive posture, resolve through dialogue and consultation whatever differences that may arise in the implementation of the agreements and draw up a roadmap and timetable to implement the agreements to the latter without delay so as to pave the way for a political solution to the Ukraine crisis. Mr. President, as to the tensions in, on the eastern frontier of Ukraine, China believes that in the current context, all parties concerned should let reason prevail, adhere to the overarching goal of a political solution, and refrain from any act that may provoke tensions or embellish the discourse about the crisis. The parties should fully consider each other's legitimate security concerns and show mutual respect and, on such a basis, properly resolve their differences through equal-footed consultations. China supports all efforts conducive to easing the tensions and notes the Russian Federation's recent diplomatic engagement with France, Germany and other European countries at the leadership level. A negotiated, balanced, effective and sustainable European security mechanism will provide a solid foundation for lasting peace and stability across Europe. 
we trust that European countries will take independent and strategic decisions in line with their own interests. In his most recent public appeal, Secretary General Guterres said, quote, There is no alternative to diplomacy. All issues, including the most intractable, can and must be addressed re and resolved through diplomatic frameworks. End quote. We support the SG's good offices aimed at reducing tensions. We also subscribe to the SG's views. Mr. President, Everything happens for a reason. NATO's enlargement is an issue that cannot be bypassed when dealing with the current tensions related to the Ukraine issue. NATO's continuous expansion in the wake of the Cold War runs counter to the trend of our times, that is, to maintain common security. One country's security cannot be obtained at the expense of another country's security. By the same token, regional security cannot be guaranteed through muscling up or even expanding a military bloc. This applies as much to the European region as to other regions of the world. There is one country that refuses to renounce its Cold War mentality. It says one thing and does another. In order to seek absolute military superiority, it has been cleaning up in the Asia-Pacific region, creating some trilateral and quadrilateral small circles or cliques bent on provoking confrontation. What it is doing would only throw the Asia-Pacific into division and turmoil and seriously threaten the region's peace and stability, to the detriment of the countries in the region, while gaining nothing for itself either. China urges the countries concerned to learn from history, subscribe to the notion of common, comprehensive, cooperative and sustainable security, adhere to the approach of enhancing mutual trust and settling disputes through dialogue and consultation, and do more to contribute to world peace and regional stability. I thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I thank you. The representative of China for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Albania. Mr. President, I thank the USG Di Carlo, Ambassadors Kinunen and Chevik for their briefing. We welcome the high participation, high level participation in this meeting. Let me first express our gratitude to the OEC Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine, which continues to work in a volatile and unpredictable environment. And as we heard from Ambassador Civic, under multiple challenges and restrictions. We must continue to support the women and men of the um, monitoring mission, their tireless efforts in contributing to reducing tensions and fostering peace, stability, and security, and to monitoring and supporting the implementations of all OSC principles and commitments throughout Ukraine. Mr. President, Albania supports the implementation of the Minsk Agreement. We reject any pressure on Ukraine to implement Minsk Agreement according to one side interpretation. Albania expresses its full support for the rights of minorities in Ukraine and anywhere else. Minorities should enjoy their rights and participate actively in the social and political life of the country where they live. This must be part of overall commitments to equally serving all the population and building an inclusive and democratic society. Yet, as we have seen more than once, problems start when minorities are intentionally, intentionally instrumentalized to create dysfunctional states. Asking for executive powers for Russian minorities in Ukraine means nothing less than taking control of the decision-making power in Kiev to dictate foreign, security and defense policies and undermine democratic processes. We should not accept such policy of fabricating dysfunctional states not in Ukraine, not anywhere else. In this very context, we are deeply concerned by the Russian parliament call for the recognition of independence and sovereignty of parts of the territory of Ukraine. Here we are with the stereotype playbook that we have seen in Georgia in 2008. If taken, such decisions would have no legal validity. They are against international law, they are against UN Charter, 
they run totally against the substance of the Minsk agreements. Mr. President, we continue to be alarmed by the very large scale, unprovoked and unjustified Russian military build-up in and around Ukraine and in Belarus. The much claimed withdrawal of some of the troops stationed there is not verified and credible reports indicate the contrary. A further reinforcement with active combat troops and weapons, which reportedly now number 150,000. This continued and reinforcing military surrounding is a Damocles sword over the government and people of Ukraine. It instigates fear to the population. It threatens the domestic and foreign investors and seeks to bring the economy into collapse and the country to its knees. The decision to partially block the Black Sea and the Sea of Zazov and the Kerch Strait under the pretext of holding regular naval exercises only adds to this strangulation effort. Further, the most recent reports of heavy shelling from the occupied territory in Donbas only reinforce the worries about the pretext to start executing a long and carefully designed scenario. In this context, let me reiterate our firm position in support of the sovereignty, territorial integrity of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders. We demand the removal of the occupying troops from the occupied territory. We condemn the illegal annexation of Crimea and its military support to the separatist forces in the country. Albania remains committed to the fundamental principles underpinning European security, including that each nation has the right to choose its own security arrangements. Any renewed attack on the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine would be a clear and further breach of international law, would severely affect European security, and should be met with outright and vigorous condemnation. We call on this Council and on the international community not to let Ukraine down not to accept policies and actions that threaten the existence of a sovereign nation. Mr. President, despite everything indicating acceleration of escalation, we will continue to emphasize the value and the importance of diplomacy and dialogue in reaching a peaceful solution in the conflict in eastern Ukraine and dealing with Russian concerns. Russia should take the offer to engage in a renewed European security dialogue initiated by Poland as the current OSC chair. We support the call of Secretary Blinken for talks with Minister Lavrov as soon as possible and renewed NATO-Russia Council meetings. Every mechanism must be used and fully exploited for diplomacy and de-escalation. Finally, we welcome the calls, the, the calls of the Secretary General to defuse tension and to de-escalate actions on the ground. We would support the intensification of these efforts and the availability of his good offices in the search of a peaceful solution. I thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> I thank the representative of Albania for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of France. Mr. President, I would like to thank the Under Secretary General for Political Affairs, Special Representative of the Chairperson in Office in Ukraine and the Head of the Special Monitoring Mission of the OSCE in Ukraine for their briefings. The implementation of the Minsk agreements cannot be considered separately from the situation on the borders of Ukraine. Tensions there in recent days have reached an unprecedented level due to the strengthening of military activity on the part of Russia. France has been involved in ongoing efforts with our partners over recent weeks with a view to uh, de-escalation and dialogue. Our position is founded on two pillars. Firstly, the build-up of military, considerable military capacity on the border of a neighbor constitutes threatening behavior and is unacceptable. And this is particularly the case since Russia has already infringed the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine in the past. Any new aggression will have massive consequences and severe costs for Russia. Europeans are united and we are ready to act in coordination with all partners on this matter. 
Secondly, France is convinced that de-escalation is possible through dialogue and through diplomacy. This is exactly what President Macron's efforts have been doing in coordination with the German Chancellor. We are prepared to undertake this dialogue not only with regard to the conflict in Donbass, that is the work that we do within the Normandy format, but also with regard to questions of security and stability in Europe, whilst respecting the fundamental principles established by the United Nations Charter and in the founding documents of the OSCE, which are the Helsinki Final Act and the Charter of Paris for a New Europe. In this regard, we fully support the process uh, initiated under the po Polish presidency of the OSCE for renewed dialogue on European security. I would now like to come back to the implementation of the Minsk agreements which have mobilized France and Germany since 2015. Efforts have been continued over recent weeks within the Normandy format. The Paris meeting on the 26th of January made it possible to once again express the support of all parties for the unconditional respect of the ceasefire. But we need to go further, which unfortunately has not, was not possible during the meeting of the 10th of February. We weren't able to f record concrete progress in the implementation of the Minsk uh, package of measures in all their dimensions, namely security, humanitarian and political. France is firmly convinced that the Minsk agreements constitute the suitable framework for pursuing dialogue and that they leave open the ne a necessary space for defining mutually acceptable concrete solutions, particularly within the trilateral contact group. We call upon the parties to abstain from any declaration or measure which will work against the implementation of these agreements. And in this regard, we express our concern with regard to the adoption by the State Duma of the Russian Federation of a resolution calling for recognition of the separatist territories of Ukraine. If it were to pass, this resolution would constitute uh, an assumed violation of the sovereignty and the territorial integrity of Ukraine by Russia and a fundamental calling into question of the Minsk agreements. We also welcome the role of the special monitoring mission of the OSCE in Ukraine, which plays an essential role in efforts at de-escalation. It is the ears and the eyes of the international community. France, just like Germany, will keep its nationals deployed on the ground so that this mission remain operational during this critical period. We have taken note of the information provided by the OSCE with regard to possible violations of the ceasefire in recent hours. We would wish that systematically the special mission be able to uh, gather the facts impartially. Mr. President, the defense of the principles of the United Nations Charter, in particular respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states, as well as the Pacific settlement of disputes, must be a goal that is shared by all members of this Council. France will continue to be mobilized to this end as well as for the building of a just and lasting peace and for the um, restoring of full Ukrainian sovereignty over certain regions of Donetsk and Luhansk. Thank you. I thank the representative of France for his statement. I now give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to thank Under Secretary uh, General Madame Rosemary de Carlo for her briefing. And I would also like to thank uh, Special Representative Kinunen and the head of the uh, uh, Special Monitoring Mission, Mr. Yasa Halit Chevik, for their briefings. And I welcome amongst us Madame Tatiana Montian. Uh, Mr. President, 
my country continues to very closely follow the situation uh, along the border between Russia and Ukraine. We understand the fears and the uh, cause of alarm of those who uh, fear imminent military action. And we particularly note the willingness expressed by the uh, parties involved to keep the uh, diplomatic and political channels open, as well as the various calls to avoid escalation. In parallel to this alarmist rhetoric and shows of force, the last 10 days have been uh, particularly marked by intense activity diplomatically. Uh, we've seen European and US initiatives uh, that had the goal of sowing the seeds of dialogue and avoiding the point of no return. The recent announcement by Russia that it was withdrawing part of its troops that were uh, grouped on the border uh, certainly shows a willingness to de-escalate, and that is added to the repeated assurances of Russia that they have no aggressive intentions. That should play a significant role in reducing the level of tension and to uh, restoring indispensable trust for that's necessary for preventive diplomacy. In the same regard, my country uh, understands from the recent address of the President of the United States of America that we need to favor dialogue and that there will be refusal of confrontation because this would have disastrous consequences for all. Mr. President, the situation is certainly not simple, but it's precisely because it isn't simple that it needs to be addressed serenely and with the greatest sense of responsibility. And it's with that goal in mind that we would like to reiterate our call to all parties involved to show restraint and to favor dialogue and negotiation in order to preserve uh, stability and peace in the region. We encourage all initiatives which are uh, carried out in favor of de-escalation and a resumption of dialogue. And we call upon the parties involved to make better use of the diplomatic channels that exist to begin de-escalation. In this regard, the Normandy format and the uh, Minsk agreements are reference frameworks. The Minsk agreements give the outline for a peaceful uh, outcome to the different claims of the parties. And that's why they have been endorsed by the United Nations. The implementation of these agreements is essential in order to uh, ensure a cessation of hostilities and restore the borders of Ukraine and provide a better humanitarian response, whilst opening up the way for restoration of peaceful neighborly relations and possibly also uh, renewed economic relations. My country calls upon the parties to respect the commitments that they have made and to build on what has been achieved, this foundation of what has been achieved, and to resume dialogue. The uh, call for dialogue from the uh, state, uh, um, Mr. Antidi Blinken, Secretary of State, uh, is a step in the right direction. Certainly, my country is firmly attached to respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of every state. These cardinal principles are enshrined in the United Nations Charter and in the founding act of the European, uh, of the African Union. This, they are the cement of a social contract as members of an international community. In conclusion, on behalf of my country, I would like to call upon this council to be more mobilized than ever in order to um, stem this uh, fear and um, reject any confrontation we must use the tools of peace that we have, uh, and that we can do when we show that we are united and responsible. Thank you. Yeah, I thank the representative of Gabon for his statement. I will now make a further statement in my capacity as Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. I listened uh, very carefully to the discussion, to the statements which were made by colleagues, and I would like to dwell on uh, some issues that were touched upon. First of all, I would like to draw your attention to the unnecessary speculation as regards uh, the appeal of members of the Gostuma to the President with a request to acknowledge um, Donbass. This is a proposal to consider. 
this uh, issue, although the fact that it's there reflects uh, the feeling of uh, our people about Donbass. Their people have been for many years subject to shelling by the um, Ukrainian army, and th- we've heard that today. Hundreds of thousands of people in that Ukrainian region have Russian citizenship. Uh, They probably didn't have uh, any other option after Ukraine stopped um, um, discharging its social responsibility towards them. But let me underscore yet once again that this is an initiative. This is an appeal from the deputies of the Gostuma. So what we need to do is concentrate on the implementation of the Minsk agreements, and many have said so today, rather than uh, speculate about this. All they, it is uh, also equally important to, to make sure that we avoid uh, discussing uh, these issues within the Security Council, otherwise we will be discussing any decision of any parliament in the world here. Let me draw your attention to another thing that was said by President Putin. He said that we need to do um, utmost to make sure that the solution to Donbass should be found through the implementation of the Minsk Agreement. Distinguished Mr. Cleverly talked about the background, the prehistory to the issue today, and I don't uh, think that the picture he painted was a correct one. It was one-sided and superficial. Let me just recall one historic period which preceded many an issue, namely an illegal and bloody um, coup d'etat in Kiev in 2014. Uh, The radicals and nationalists came into power then. Uh, They refused to have a dialogue with the Russian-speaking people. They threatened them. Um, The Russian language is uh, being discriminated and continues to be discriminated against. Uh, Versions of history are being put forward, which uh, include uh, even the glorification of uh, Nazi criminals. This is something that happened and continues. And this uh, led to the uh, separation of the Crimea and reunification with Russia as a result of a referendum. So the conflict uh, uh, now is uh, something that has to have a clear picture, which which, which is a, a reflection of a real situation. Now, as regards to the alleged prepared aggression of Russia against Ukraine, well, some uh, people are uh, very uh, usefully in inverted uh, commas uh, put forward the military scenarios, and this was done by the Secretary of State of the United States, and he listed the provocations that could be used as a pretext to invade Ukraine, and this is uh, regrettable. Um, I would even go so far as to say that they are dangerous because they bring in more attention into the already tense atmosphere, but these are words. Um, Um, and statements. We made a large number of statements of various levels which underscore what it is that we propose that that we intend to do. And it's uh, very unfortunate that those statements at the highest level that uh, came out of um, Moscow were not uh, heeded. But those are statements. So what do we have um, on the plane of actual facts? The fact is that the Russian forces were in the Russian territory and remain on the on the Russian territory. And the day before yesterday, some of the units, after their exercises, were returning to their home bases in Russia. And the Russian officials uh, are saying, have been saying, I am saying that my country is conducting drills in our own territory in the regime that we deem needed. Um, Also, there are some other facts that I would like to draw your attention to, facts in addition to words. Ukraine is violating the Vienna document of 2011 on confidence building measures. On the Ukrainian side, there is 122,000 troops. Um, The United States last year provided weapons to Ukraine to the amount of $650 million. Uh, That is a lot. In January, $200 million worth of dollars of weaponry was provided. And we are not even talking about what's being provided by um, UK, Canada, and the Baltic states. All of these states are sending lethal weaponry to Kiev, attack, uh, um, aircraft, uh, multiple rocket launchers, stingers, javelins, uh, rifles, ammunition for them. 
Poland is uh, providing ammunition for 122, 125 mill millimeter weapons, which are banned under the Minsk agreements, as we know. So this information aggression constant statements about the Russian aggression, why they need it in order to be able to supply all of these things under the pretext of the Russian aggression. So what we see here is obvious, is the, is the desire to bark down the discussion about the legal obligations um, um, as regards the situation. We are ready for a dialogue, for a very serious dialogue, not imitation dialogue, but a real one. Today, uh, as you know, the um, U.S. Uh, um, ambassador in Moscow received our reaction uh, on the issue of uh, um, your security guarantees, and we do hope that this will be very carefully looked at in Washington because it's a very detailed and written document. Thank you. For that, I am resuming my function as President of the Council. And uh, the representative of the United States has asked for the floor for, the fur for a further statement. You have the floor. Thank you very much. I, I had hoped uh, that what we would hear uh, in response uh, from our Russian colleague, a response to Secretary Blinken's call for Russia to announce today without equivocation that they do not plan to invade Ukraine, but instead it was a continuation of uh, the disinformation and the rhetoric that we have, uh, we continue to hear and we've heard before. The Secretary of State laid out the facts. Uh, he laid out the facts that we see on the ground and that all of you are seeing on the ground very clearly. And what we all see is escalation uh, including the decision by the Russian Duma to call for recognition of a separatist movement in total disdain for the Minsk uh, agreement. And hopefully, as you stated, uh, this will not, go, uh, it will not go any further. But let me just say clearly for this room, for all of you who called for uh, diplomacy, we will continue to intensify. We will continue to escalate our diplomatic efforts, and we call for Russia to cease confrontation and accept our invitation uh, to dialogue. We will look forward to engaging at the negotiating table uh, to discuss the response that the Russians uh, sent uh, to, to us just this morning. And I will end by saying what Secretary Blinken said today. He did not come here to promote war but he came here to prevent war and to find a way to a peaceful solution. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United States for her statement. Uh, I now give the floor to the representative of Ukraine. Distinguished members of the Security Council, all protocols observed. On this day seven years ago, the Ukrainian city of Debaltseve sustained a full-fledged offensive by the Russian regular troops and their proxies. Heavy artillery and rocket shellings did not spare neither Ukrainian military nor civilians. All this happened despite the disengagement line agreed by Ukraine and Russia under the Minsk Memorandum of 19 September 2014, the second document in the set of the Minsk agreements, which clearly defined the Debaltseva is a government control area. This happened despite the Minsk package of measures was signed a week earlier, and its first provision contained commitment to, to comprehensive ceasefire. 
This is just one example of how Russia violated the agreements almost immediately after signing them. So far, this respect to undertaking commitments remains a hallmark of Russia's strategy. Only this morning, the Ukrainian Stanitsa Luganska was shelled with heavy weapons from occupied territory of Donbas. Civilian infrastructure damaged, including a daycare center. Upon the instructions of my government, I have to bring to, to the attention of the Security Council another outrageous situation that undermines the Minsk agreements and the entire process of peaceful settlement. Two days ago, the Russian Duma appealed to the Russian president to recognize the occupied parts of the Donetsk and Lugansk regions of Ukraine as so-called Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. This decision runs counter the commitments undertaken by Russia as a signatory of the Minsk agreements. Therefore, I requested the Security Council in my letter to the Security Council dated 16 February 2022 to consider this, this situation today. Our standpoint remains unchanged. Russia's recognition of the so-called Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics will be tantamount to its deliberate withdrawal from the Minsk agreements. Such a move will cause a serious blow to the political diplomatic settlements that Ukraine and its partners have been actively engaged to promote. Recognition of the so-called republics will have no legal implications. Russia will not succeed at masking the Russian occupation administrations in the temporarily occupied territories of Lugansk and Donetsk regions as independent entities or to disguise its own involvement as a party to the armed conflict in Donbas. Instead, if the Russian president endorses the ruling of the state Duma, it will have much broader destructive consequences for the international rules-based order and the global security architecture. Therefore, Russia has a choice to embark on the path of de-escalation and diplomatic dialogue or experience decisive consolidated response by the international community. It is a matter of practical concern that the same pattern was implemented and the same language was used in 2008, despite what the deputy minister just said, referring that it is just an appeal of Duma. In 2008, the appeal by the State Duma of the Russian Federation to the Russian President Medvedev on the need to recognize the Republic of South Ossetia and the Republic of Abkhazia preceded the presidential decree on such recognition adopted on 26 of August 2008. So just don't call it a mere appeal by Duma. I thank the Secretary of State, Mr. Blinken, for his powerful statement of February 16 on the issue of Duma's decision, as well as I thank the Foreign Minister, Le Drian of France, for his clear statement, as well as I thank Minister Cleverly of the UK for his statement today, as well as I thank Norway, Ireland, Albania, and many other partners and responsible members of the international community for their statements on this issue. And I would like to ask the Secretariat of the Security Council to make my letter part of the proceedings, letter dated February 16. It is important, however, as well, because the soft and feeble reaction of the UN in 2008 resulted in lasting occupation of parts of the Georgian territory. And I will not quote what the then Secretary Ban Ki-moon said and what the PGA said at that moment. 
We hope that the UN leader leadership today learned the lessons from the occupation of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And we all, both members and the states and the secretariat, will be more vocal on defending the UN Charter. I addressed my letter on the issue to the Secretary General, and I wait for a meaningful reply by the Secretary General to my letter. We call on Russia to take a constructive stance towards achieving pro progress in the framework of the existing negotiations formats. Otherwise, Russia will be a full responsibility for ruining the Minsk agreements and the process of peaceful settlement of the armed conflict. The Minsk agreements are the complex of three documents, and we should approach its implementation from this standpoint. Starting from the Minsk Protocol of 5th September, 5th of September 2014, let me remind you that according to the paragraph 4 of this document, Ukraine and Russia agreed on establishment of security zones in the border areas of Ukraine and Russia with the OEC permanent monitoring and verification on the border. Ukraine expects Russia to deliver on this agreed commitment, which would become a major input into the resolution efforts. It is more than urgent now, as about 150,000 Russian troops have been deployed in the vicinity of the Ukraine's borders. We note the statements by the Russian officials on their withdrawal, although verification and credible proofs are required. Unusual military activities on Ukraine's borders that Russia denied to explain in violation of the Vienna document, document on confidence and security building measures have a detrimental economic and social impact on Ukraine already, regardless of ultimate plans by Russia. The military buildup on the ground has been coupled with a blockade by Russia of the large parts of the Black Sea under the pretext of naval exercises. This has made navigation and international shipping extremely complicated, causing serious challenges for the major Ukrainian ports. All these actions feed into the concept of the hybrid war against Ukraine, with disinformation and cyber attacks as its other important components. For instance, the most recently, Russia pulled another propaganda ace up its sleeve, blaming Ukraine for genocide in the occupied territories. These are fake and irresponsible allegations by Russia aimed at hiding its responsibility for the occupation of the Ukrainian territories and subsequent human rights violations there. Excellencies, Ukraine remains committed to peaceful resolution of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict by political diplomatic means. Ukraine wants peace, security, and stability, not only for itself, but also for the entire Europe. At the same time, I reiterate that in the event of Russia opting for escalation, Ukraine will defend itself. We welcome all diplomatic and other efforts taken at different levels to prevent the worst case scenario. We are grateful for support and solidarity with Ukraine so explicitly demonstrated worldwide. We reiterate the need to further explore all political means to ensure the escalation. Reinvigorating the Normandy format and the trilateral counter group is one of the necessary steps. Both include Russia and Ukraine as parties to the conflict and constitute the proper framework for their direct dialogue. The dialogue that Russia still avoids and hides behind their puppet occupation administrations. As long as Russia makes preconditions about direct dialogue between Ukraine and Moscow's proxies, which are effectively a non starter the progress on the implementation of the Minsk agreements will remain elusive. Hence, it was important that political advisors met in Paris and Berlin, despite many 
divergences on implementation the Minsk agreements persist. We are ready to resume the N4 talks in all formats, including at the level of the leaders. We regret that Russia remains unwilling to hold N4 summit. The last time our leaders met in Paris in December 2019, the decisions adopted then remain unimplemented by Russia, despite Ukraine regularly put forward concrete initiatives on ceasefire, humanitarian demining, withdrawal of troops and hardware, mutual release of detained persons, opening new entry exit points, ensuring unimpeded access of the OEC SMM throughout the conflict affected area, as well as implementation of the political provisions of the Minsk agreements. On 22 December last year, we managed to find a common understanding on resuming the ceasefire regime, initially launched in July 2020. We offered far-reaching compromises to strike the deal, but ceasefire violations by the Russian occupation forces have not yet halted. Restrictions of the SMM freedom of movement continue to be a major implement for the implementation in full of the SMM mandate. During the last meeting of the TCG on February 9, Chief Monitor Chevik provided statistical information confirming that 90% of restrictions of the freedom of movement of SMM patrols occur in the temporarily occupied territories of Donbass. We call on Russia to ensure unfitted access of the SMM throughout the entire territory under the, its infective control, in particular in the border areas. This is practically important against the backdrop of the Russia's decision not to extend the mandate of the OECE border observer mission at the Russian checkpoint Gukova and Donetsk shut down last September. In this regard, we support the initiative by France and Germany to establish a coordination and verification mechanism for the OEC SMM. On the political track, discussions on such issues as implementation of the so-called Steinmeier formula, the special order of local self-government is in certain areas of Donetsk and Lugansk regions. Amnesty law, modalities of local elections so far continue to be blocked by the Russian side. The Russian representatives simply refuse to continue discussions on the working proposals submitted by the Ukrainian delegation back in June 2020, relating to the special order of the local self-government in certain areas in Donetsk and Lugansk regions of Ukraine, and other issues on the agenda of the political working group. Ukraine has taken steps on implementation of agreed provisions relate, relating to the political process. In particular, we submit for consideration by the trilateral counter group initial proposals to the law on special order of local self-government in certain areas of Donetsk and Lugansk regions of Ukraine. According to ADIR standards, resumption of control of the border should be a prerequisite for holding local elections in Donbass. Otherwise, it would be impossible to create the necessary security environment for holding the democratic elections in line with the OEC standards. Excellencies. It remains up to Russia to take decisions that would lead to full implementation of the commitments it has undertaken under the Minsk agreements signed by President Putin's ambassador to Ukraine, Zurabov, in blue ink. On September 5, 2014, Mr. Zurabov signed the agreement. On September 19, Mr. Zurabov, ambassador of Putin, signed the agreement. On February 12, 2015, ambassador of Putin signed the agreement. Drawing lessons from the past, we urge Russia to abandon its long-lasting strategy on Ukraine, based on threat and use of force against the territorial integrity of Ukraine based on fundamental 
principles of peaceful relations enshrined in the UN Charter. But before I end, let me address Sergei Vasilievich Paruski. In Russian. Recently, the mass media disseminated a text which is uh, attributed to your colleague, uh, Ms. Saharova. Please allow me to quote. From the viewpoint of international law, geo geopolitical transformations of 1991 did not result in the disappearance of the Soviet Union as a subject of international law. The state, which was called the USSR, did not stop, but rather continued its existence under international law. End of quote. So I wonder how do you feel in Security Council as a representative of the USSR? That would seem to be what the document now says. When I hear such text and when I listen to Comrade Montan, I want to repeat the same words I said at the exact same meeting on the Minsk Agreement's implementation on the 18th of February 2020. <coughs> These words of a very famous Russian poet, Yevtushenko, uh, they were said in 1962. And the poet Yevtushenko then said, let them tell me to calm down. I will not stay calm for as long as the inheritors of Stalin are still alive and walking the earth, it would continue seeming to me that Stalin is still in the mausoleum. Sergei Vasilievich, we are in the 21st century. Let's get back to the UN Charter and let's start implementing the Charter. Let's change Article 23. Um, let's implement Article 22, 24, and 108. I thank you for your attention. <coughs> yeah. I thank the representative of Ukraine for his statement. And I now give the floor to the representative of Germany. Thank you, Mr. President. Germany is grateful for the opportunity to speak in today's session. We would like to thank you, Under Secretary General Di Carlo, the Special Representative of the OEC, Chairperson in Office in Ukraine and in the Trilateral Contact Group, and the head of the OEC's Special Monitoring Mission. Together with France, Germany stays committed to achieving progress in the Normandy format, which plays a central role in advancing the implementation of the Minsk agreements. Many obstacles remain. However, the reaffirmed ceasefire of July 2020 proved that progress can be made if political will is there. With regard to recent reports on increased shellings in eastern Ukraine, we recall that the agreement must be observed and it is utterly unacceptable <clears throat> that, uh, to attack civilian infrastructure. On 26 of January in Paris and on 10 February in Berlin, talks were held. All participants committed themselves to the full implementation of the Minsk agreements and to continuing talks in the N4 and in the trilateral contact group format. In this respect, uh, we express our strong concern about the resolution of the Ru Russian State Duma calling on the President of the Russian Federation to recognize the self-declared People's Republics of Luhansk and Donetsk as independent states. This would run counter to the Minsk agreements and constitute a further breach of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Mr. President, in this tense situation, it is very important to establish facts and to identify disinformation. 
We commend the OSC Special Monitoring Mission's indispensable role in establishing facts on the security situation. We must ensure that it can carry out its full mandate without interruption throughout Ukraine. This is why we leave the German, and France does the same, and other partners, seconded staff on the ground. This is also why we are deeply concerned about the restrictions of SMM monitors' freedom of movement and destruction of their equipment. Mr. President, in these days we cannot evaluate the, pre uh, the state of the Minsk agreements without factoring in military developments in the region. In recent months, an unprecedented military buildup of Russian forces has taken place on the Russian and Belarusian side of Ukraine's border. It is next to impossible to not perceive this as a threat or the preparation of for an attack. We deplore that Russia has so far failed to provide any satisfactory explanation for this course of action. The UN Charter is crystal clear in this respect. It prohibits not only the use of force, but also the mere threat of using force. Germany fully supports the sovereignty, territory, integrity, unity and independence of Ukraine within its international recognized borders, in line with the principles enshrined in the UN Charter, the Helsinki Final Act, the Charter of Paris and all OSC commitments. In order to defuse tensions, we have stepped up our diplomatic efforts in close coordination with our French partners. We have taken note of Russia's recent announcement to downsize its troop presence along the uh, side the Ukrainian border, but we call on Russia now to immediately follow up on this announcement and uh, to withdraw its troops from Ukraine, Ukraine's border substantially and verifiably. Russia should be aware that any military aggression against Ukraine would entail severe political, economic and geostrategic consequences. Moreover, we urge Russia to provide full transparency regarding its military activities. To this end, Russia should make full use of the information and consultation mechanisms provided for by the Vienna document within the OSCE framework. Together with, with its partners and allies, Germany remains open to discussing with Russia security concerns of mutual interest. Mr. President, if a sovereign member state of this organization adopts an aggressive posture towards another sovereign member state of this organization, this is not something the United Nations and its member states should be casual about. It is good that the UN bodies stay abreast of the situation around Ukraine. And we will have uh, a debate in the General Assembly on 23rd of February. Germany certainly will remain strongly committed to finding a diplomatic solution and we hope others will too. Thank you. I'm grateful to the representative of Germany for her statement. I now would like to make a further statement in my capacity as Deputy Foreign Minister of Russian Federation. And this is what I would like to say. We have heard here today words such as war, aggression. The most interesting thing is that no one has ever has said those words on behalf of uh, Moscow or Russia, or will say those words. I regret that very strong, very serious statements made by Mr. Putin in the recent days um, as uh, regards the situation um, in Ukraine in the eastern part of the country were not heard. I would like uh, our partners to at least hear what was said at the press conference where in Moscow such uh, distinguished representatives uh, visited us as a president of France, as a German chancellor. There were negotiations there and detailed press conferences where our guests spoke and the president of the Russian Federation. We have a meeting today on the Minsk package of measures. And I am very satisfied with the fact that uh, most of the statements uh, stated that the Minsk agreements 
are a very clear and the only international legal framework so to settle the inter-Ukrainian conflict. By the way, I uh, have a great deal of uh, respect for our interpreters, how they manage to keep up and speed with what they're saying and to do it correctly. Well, well, let me then make two requests here. I have two statements here. Zelensky, um, uh, Zelensky called the Minsk agreements totally without merit. Uh, yeah, well, the, the meaning was conveyed. And the s second uh, uh, statement, I listened very carefully to the statement just made, uh, including the illegal nature of the Russian membership uh, at the UN and Security Council. Unfortunately, I have to say that it's not the first time representatives of other countries, including Ukraine, ha want to uh, self-aggrandize uh, um, using this argument. Uh, and the calculation here is very clear. It's for the benefit of those who are not very, very, very well-versed in uh, uh, these issues. Well, if we are going to discuss whether or not the Russia went through the procedure of becoming a member of the UN, well, uh, we could ask the same question of Ukraine. Maybe Ukraine uh, is uh, um, also a Ukrainian social, Soviet Socialist Republic. Russia is a successor state to the USSR. A Ukraine is a new statehood. As regards poems and quoting them, it's a very good thing when a political message is in, in a poetic form. But I do like poems myself about beauty, for example. It's uh, by um, poet Zabolotsky, um, a Russian, a Soviet um, uh, poet. And the question in the poem is about beauty, whether the beauty is a vessel itself or whether it is the fire that the vessel contains. And I would hope, um, I, mean, I hope the interpreters manage with that, but I would compare beauty with wisdom. And we have to make sure that we come up with wise decision when it comes to also the settlement in Ukraine on the basis of the Minsk package of measures. Thank you. I uh, once again uh, resume my function as President of Security Council. And we do not have uh, any names on the list of speakers anymore, but I would like to put my question to the briefers, our briefers, and ask them whether they would like to uh, make comments. Ms. Rosemary DiCarlo, under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. I have no further comments to make. Yes, thank you. Uh, Miko Kinunen, a special representative of the OSC chairperson in office in Ukraine and in the Trilateral Contact Group. The President, also no uh, further comments. Uh, however, I would very much like to thank for possibility to participate uh, in this briefing of the UN Security Council today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'm putting the same question to His Excellency Mr. Yashar Halichevik, Chief Monitor of the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission in Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll join my uh, fellow briefers and thank you. I have no further comments. And now the question is to, to Ms. Tatiana Mantian. Unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Could you press the microphone button, please? We can hear you now. 
Мне очень... Many people have written to me after my speech, and they're saying to me, please uh, tell them that no one is in fear of an imminent Russian invasion, except for those people who have been inflicting violence on Ukraine of eighth year running. Well, they will leave Ukraine clutching American aircraft. The rest of them will uh, take it in stride because the collective West, that exactly was the reason behind their coup d'etat and Maidan. That was the game to throw the troops of the current Kiev regime into Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, receive a reaction, and then uh, play a game with sanctions. But we will see who will stand to lose from sanctions more. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Montian, for your statement. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. I thank the interpreters especially. Uh, the meeting is adjourned.